How are we all? Happy Sabbath. Yeah, praise the Lord. It's such a blessing um, to be able to be together and to worship together on this um, beautiful day. Amen. Oh, evening. Sorry. Beautiful evening. And um, so we're just going to study together a quick devotion. Hopefully we'll be challenged, but also encouraged. Amen. And, um, and so, before we start, let us start with a word of prayer and invite the presence of God. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, dear Father, that Lord, we have such a wonderful privilege to be able to open your word. And so, dear Father, we just ask and pray, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. I pray that, Lord, may you please guide us into all truth. I pray, dear Father, that you may especially give me clarity of mind and give me the right words to share with my brothers and sisters, that we may be encouraged and challenged. And Lord, we just ask and pray that your presence may be here. And Father, speak to us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to look at um, something um, well, I find interesting in the scriptures. And that is the topic of faith, the topic or the subject of faith. Um, More so on on the perspective of clinging to the promises of Scripture. You see, this word here, this word that we have in our hands, hopefully, not your iPhone, not your Samsung, but the Bible, that we have in our hands is very sure. It's a tested and tried truth. It's God's Word, that when you read it, as you go through the passage of Scripture, that you are reading God's very own words. Do you agree with that? Yes? And so, really, this Word, the promises in the Bible are more sure than life itself. It's more sure, the promises of Scriptures are more sure than the next maybe 30 minutes that we have together, or even tomorrow. It's more sure than you having a meal on the table. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? But oftentimes, we don't see it that way. (laughs) Um, But hopefully, we'll just have a look, uh, journey through the scriptures together, and have a look at some passages in there, and be encouraged and also challenged at the same time. Amen? All right, let's have a look into the book of 2 Corinthians, and let's just lay a quick foundation. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verse number 20. I love this scripture. Uh, I share it almost every time. (laughs) I love this scripture. Um, 2 Corinthians 1 and verse number 20. Are you guys there? Yes? Not yet? All right, most of you are. All right, so the Bible says, For all the promises of God are in Him, what? Yay, Yay. or yes. And in Him, Amen, Amen. unto the glory of God by us. This is a powerful scripture. Well, I find it very powerful. That the promises of the scriptures, the promises of God are yea, or yes. They are firm. They are tested, tried, and true. Do you believe that? Don't answer me. Do you believe that? Um, It's something that we really need to uh, really ask ourselves. When I read a promise in the Bible, do I see and do I believe that this scripture, that this promise in scripture is sure, that is tested, and true. What does that term actually mean? What is tested and true or tried and true? What does that term mean? English is not my first language, so please, those who are able to help me, what does tried and true mean? Come on, I like interaction. Don't be shy. It has come to pass. It has what? It has come to pass. It has come to pass. Yes, I like that. Yes. Tried and true. No, it's implying to something to be acceptable. Yes. It must, you do it once, but then if it's repeatable, if it keeps repeating, then it's true. That's right. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. So, um, sorry? Proven beyond doubt. Proven beyond doubt. Amen. Amen. All right. Anything else? So, in, um, in mathematics, going on uh, with uh, what Joe. Joe, okay, with what Joe um, said, for example, in mathematics, there is what you call QED, or you put a little box when you uh, finish or complete an equation, or, and in that, when the lecturer does that on the board, it means this is a tested and tried formula, and it is proven. You can't dispute it. And it is true. So by tested and tried, it means that this promise has gone under scrutiny and it has come out to be true. Would you agree with that? This promise of scripture has gone under scrutiny and has proven to be true. Interesting, isn't it? <laughs> All right, we're just, we're just, I'm just, just sharing just a few thoughts. And uh, let's have a look at something. Um, let's go to the book of Mark. Mm. Mark chapter 5. And let's have a look at verse 24. And we'll go to verse 34. This is the story of the woman with the issue of blood. The story with the issue of blood. The woman with the issue of blood. Are we there? All right. The Bible says, And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, how many years, friends? Twelve. Twelve years. Would you say that's a long time to struggle with a certain disease? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Very much so. And she had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. Here is a woman, she has a particular disease, an issue of blood, for 12 years. And the Bible says that when she heard of him, when she did what? She heard of him. What might she have heard? That here is a teacher from Nazareth. He heals the sick. He raises people from the dead. And he does what? He cures those who were born blind. He cures every disease. She heard of Jesus. Right? And when she hears this, we could say, I'm reading in, I'm reading in between the text now, we could say that faith sprung up. Would you agree? That if Jesus could have done it for them, if he could have done it, for Bartimaeus, if he could have done it to the impotent man in the pool of Bethsaida, he can do it for me. me. Okay, so we're together so far. Amen? All right, let's continue reading. So she heard of Jesus and came behind the press and touched his garment. And touched what? His garment. This is an interesting faith. Because the faith that sprung up told her that if this man is so powerful to heal this certain, this any, these diseases, in which has never been heard to be cured ever in the history of mankind. If, um, if you read John chapter 9, you find um, that account of the man born blind. He testifies there has never been an account where a person born blind was healed. A powerful story. But she, heard, she hears things like this, and she says, Surely, if he's so powerful, I don't even need to talk to him. If I may but touch the border of his garment, I will be made whole. 
And when you read Ellen White, she says um, she mustered up, and I'm using my own words now, she mustered up all the faith, uh, the faith of a lifetime. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. The faith of a lifetime in that one touch was concentrated in the faith of a lifetime. Anyways, let's continue. It says, For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. <laughs> Amen, friends. And straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him. Did Jesus feel it? Yes. But friends, you know, just on that point. Okay, let me finish this verse. Sorry, I'm getting too excited. Uh, Turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? Did virtue come out of him? Did virtue come out of Christ? He felt virtue come out of Christ. But now next question, was he depreciated of virtue now? No. <laughs> Someone say amen for God. <laughs> Friends, that's powerful. It seems like a simple thing, but that's powerful. Christ could feel virtue come out of him, but he is not depreciated of virtue. What does that mean? That the power that came out of Christ to heal the woman did not deplete the reserve, to use human terminology, that Christ had. Does that make sense? And so the same Jesus... The same power that healed that woman can heal us today. Does that, does that make sense, friends? All right. Praise the Lord. Let's continue. Let's continue. All right. You know, um, and Jesus says, so who touched me? Verse 31. And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? <coughs> And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing that uh, what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Amen, friends. Now here is the disciples say, You see everyone touching you. <laughs> Everyone is touching you. And you're asking who touched you? Now, is that a good question? It's a logical question, isn't it? But Jesus could tell the difference, could differentiate the, the touch. And touch. The normal touch, uh, yes. And the touch of faith, friends. Sometimes, too often, maybe we touch Jesus just with a normal touch. Mm-hmm. Just with a normal touch. Let's look at this um, As well, in Luke chapter 5. Look at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, verse 17, yes. Look at this. This is so sad, friends, actually. It's really sad. But notice this. The Bible says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching that there there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And notice, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. If you know Luke 5 verse 17. So if you know the story, you know that this is the story where the uh, paralytic man or the paralyzed man is healed by Jesus. All right. But notice that in verse 17, it says the power of the Lord was present to heal the Pharisees. But when you read verse 20 and 21, you find that the Pharisees do completely opposite. They accuse Jesus of blasphemy. They accuse Jesus of what? Blasphemy. So it is possible to be in the presence of the great physician and go home worse than what you came in. Isn't that interesting? So it is possible to touch Jesus. It is possible to be in the very presence of Jesus, but yet receive nothing because of lack of faith. But what is this faith? Uh, is a question that I often so ask myself. What is this faith? And usually the answer is um, Hebrews 11 verse 1. 
I don't say usually to say it's wrong. Um, the faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. What does that mean? Let me ask you. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What does that mean? <laughs> it's reversed to I'll see it and I believe it. You believe it first before you see it. Right, yes. You believe it first before you see it. Thank you, Joe. It's like there's a substance presented. Mm -hmm. It's been given an example. Mm -hmm. Mm. It will become your substance. Right, okay, okay. That's interesting, yeah. It may take a while sometimes. Yeah, right. Amen, okay, okay. Anyone else? Well, it's a promise that somebody makes to you, mm. and you, you hope that it's going to happen, but you can't see it happening. Mm. You haven't, haven't yet because they promise it for the future. Yeah, okay. Question to you, is faith blind? As in, the if, you, if you know, like you see, it's been tried and tested. Mm. If you know God is going to do it, right? I had this issue a couple of months back. I was going through a bit, you know, health crisis. But mm. I've been struggling with it for a while, but I just went and sat on the park bench, and it just came to me, you know, very strongly <clears throat> that thing trust, let go and let God. Mm. I thought, now I've heard this saying so many times, I've used it myself so many times, and suddenly it was so real. It really, like I got the real juice of that statement of what it really meant, and integrated into me. And I thought, wow, how crazy. You know, um, you, you, if you let go and let God, I mean, you, you can't say God can't do it. Mm. Of course God can do it. So suddenly there's this huge relief of trusting in God. And knowing that God can do. Amen. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, yeah, yes, my brother. Yeah. Yeah. Faith is evidence. Uh, it's a substance. Mm -hmm. Hope for. It's hope for. That's really interesting. And the evidence of things not seen. Yes. It's like uh, the evidence, the only evidence you have is someone's word. Mm -hmm. And ultimately the word. Mm -hmm. Which is not seen right. in yourself. Mm. But you hope for that, uh, that hope for that substance and that evidence of that word that you heard mm. of things not seen, yeah, it becomes substance in yourself by faith. Amen. Amen. Yes. A bit complicated. Um, faith is blind physically, but not spiritually. Can you say that? Faith is blind physically because you can't actually see the things. Mm. Substance. Substance means something material. That's right. Tangible. You yes. can see it and touch it. Mm -hmm. um, but so in that sense, faith is blind physically. Mm -hmm. But spiritually mm -hmm. you know because you know because you know. Mm. itself, if you read down in paragraph 11 of Hebrews, mm -hmm. it actually describes what, what does it mean to have faith, you know, mm. and there's a typical one here, it says, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he con condemned the world as being heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Mm -hmm. So God told him there was going to be a flood. Mm -hmm. He had to prepare an ark. He, he, he hasn't seen a flood ever before. Mm. But he had to do it. So, yeah. yeah, kind of. So it's the whole chapter describes a lot about what exactly the substance of things of fall and the evidence of things that sin. I think faith uh, uh, relies completely on him and trust him inside the power. Mm. Amen. Oh.
So friends, faith in itself. Um, I would say um, with what you said, my sister, um, that faith may be physically blind, as you cannot see it physically, but not spiritually. I would agree with that. Faith is not blind uh, to say that it's not based on nothing. The reason why you believe in God is not because you do not see Him. Okay, I don't, I don't know. There should be a reason why you believe in God. In fact, there is evidences you should have as to why you believe in God. So, belief and faith is not void... Is, uh, is not void of evidence, if that makes sense. There's evidence. God never gives us, never asks us to believe something without evidence as to why to believe it. Yes? It's like he also revealed substance mm-hmm. to hope for. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes? That's exactly right. Yep. So we have all experienced that mm-hmm. we just kept forgetting that. Mm. All right, friends. Let's do a quick little study. Oh, we've been doing it the past <laughs> 20 minutes, but um, let's have a look at something. I want us to notice this story. We're going to look at it in uh, two different um, books, but let's go to Matthew first, Matthew 14. And let's have a look at verse 22, and we'll go to verse 33. I'm going to read it um, pretty quickly um, once you get there. Uh, 22 to 33. Uh, 14, verse 22 to 33. Yeah. All right. The Bible says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. But Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto the sea on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. So this is an interesting story, an uh, uh, interesting passage of Scripture. Here is Jesus and the disciples. Jesus tells his disciples to go onto the other side of the sea uh, while he disperses the multitude. And so while they're on the sea, of the Sea of Galilee, there was a storm. The Bible says that the, before the winds were contrary unto them. And does Jesus come to them? Does he come to them? Yes. He comes to them. And I want you to notice that when they see Jesus, they are afraid, right? Because they think to themselves, this is a spirit. And they start to cry out in fear, to yell. Friends, you know, fear, fear will actually misconstrue the face of Jesus. 
anyways, uh, I'll leave that point for now. But anyways, yes, I'll leave that point. But they, they're afraid and they believe that Jesus is a spirit. But Jesus tells them what? Not to be afraid. And he reassures them that it is him. And Peter says, if it's you, bid me what? Come. And what does Peter begin to do? He begins to walk on? All right. Let me change that. Jesus, uh, Peter was not walking on water. <laughs> yes, I'm not trying to change the, <laughs> what the scripture says. I, I want uh, just to illustrate what I'm trying to say. Peter was walking upon the word of God. If Jesus did not say come, could he have walked on water? Does that make sense, friends? That the scriptures, the word of God is so sure. So sure. That when you trust in it, when Jesus bids you one, come. Have you heard this term? Every command is a promise. <laughs> Everyone. Command is a promise. Sometimes we, we term it, we, we say these things, we coin these things, but we don't stop and think and actually think, what does that actually mean? That when Jesus bids you come, that is a promise. And every promise, does, do you have power to obey by God's grace? Does he give you power to obey? Yes, friends. So if Jesus says, leave the chicken drumstick, <laughs> Leave um, whatever it may be. Leave um, the soda. Leave um, the donuts. Leave those things and follow me. Is there power to obey in that promise? Yes. Yes. Notice that when Peter then lost sight of that promise and began to look at the sea, and the crashing waves. You know, when you read uh, James chapter 1, I believe is verse number eight, that he that wavereth is as if the, uh, the sea, um, the wave of the sea tossed to and fro. Anyways, let's go to another passage. Read the same story, but in a different account. Now I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. So in this account, in the book of Mark, it doesn't mention Peter walking on water. But we want to notice something. It's very interesting. Very interesting. As we look at what faith is. Mark chapter 6. And let's have a look at verse number 45. And we'll go to verse number 52. All right. Are you there? Notice this. I want you to notice something very interesting in this in this passage. And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. And when he had sent them away, he departed unto a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. All right? It's interesting that it says that Jesus would suppose that he had passed by them, right? But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them, say, and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Do you see that? <laughs> 
Isn't that interesting? Now, there's a few things that uh, in Matthew doesn't mention, but one thing that stood out to me is in verse number 52, that they considered not the miracle of the fish and loaves. Did you see that in this, the fact that they were struggling in the sea, rowing, them, rowing and struggling and afraid, was actually evidence of a lack of faith. Right? And the Bible told us why. Because they considered not what? The miracle. Friends, God never, never asked us to believe anything without first giving us evidences. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. But friends, here is Jesus and he's walking and the disciples are afraid. They're afraid and because they forgot to notice and meditate upon the other miracles in which Christ has performed, they showed a lack of faith. So what has God done in your life that you're forgetful for, of, that causes you to doubt? Because friends, when God says that he can heal all your disease, oh, can I, I'm so sorry, can I share one more scripture? One more scripture. Uh, let's go to the book of Romans real quickly. Romans in chapter 4. And let's have a look at verse number 17. <clears throat> All right, are we there? The Bible says, It is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, uh, he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Stop there. We serve an amazing God. <laughs> I don't know if you caught that there in that scripture. That when God speaks something, even though he speaks of something in the future, he speaks it as if in the present. Why? Because to him, his word is tried and true it is as if already fulfilled do you believe that isn't that powerful even god himself he speaks in the present because to him it is as if it's already fulfilled <laughs> and so friends when you ask the lord in accordance to his will and you request of him to do something for you and you know it is his will don't wonder just believe that he has already done it. Live out that he has done it. Amen? There's so many, I could, yeah, we don't have time. That's okay. We, that, that's okay. So friends, do you understand what I'm trying to say? That the promises of scripture are not just something to read and for us to be, it's like, oh, wow, that's a beautiful promise. Right? It's, it is. It's a beautiful promise. But when we read it, we need to come to the conclusion and say, and say, God has done it for them. And He has ability to do it for me. And if God is willing, if it is His will, will He do it? Yes. 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 For example, as Adventists, we believe that we should move into the country. Amen? To till our own ground. I have no money to buy a house I have no money and I told God quite plainly and frankly um, that's not to say I was rooting amen <laughs> I was talking to God and say Lord either you will give me the money to buy a property or you'll provide the property for me or you'll do something I, I don't know I, I don't want to limit God but is it God's will to move into the country yes or no yes and God does it, friends. God does it. Trust it. Believe Him. The promises of scriptures are sure. They're more sure than tomorrow. Anyways, let me close. Or else I, 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 you guys are going to sleep here until... <laughs> Alright, friends. So what have we learned? We've learned that we need to trust in the Lord. 
we need to trust in the scriptures. We need to, that when we read the promises of scripture, that we say, Lord, I believe it. I believe it. Because you've done it to them, for them. You've done it to Moses. You've done it to Peter. You've done it to Bartimaeus. Amen? And you can do it for me. All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and for your mercy. We thank you, dear God, that, Lord, your promises are sure. We thank you, Lord, we can trust in you. And, Father, when we pray, Lord, I thank you that you hear and that you are present even now. Dear Father, I pray, Lord, Father, that, Lord, may you please bless my brothers and sisters here. Help us, Lord, to draw nearer and closer to Thee, and help us to reflect the lovely image of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the blessings of your holy Sabbath day. We ask and pray that, Lord, may you please abide in our hearts, and may your presence be felt. I thank you, dear Father, that, Lord, there is a special blessing, Lord, that you always have in store for your people on the Sabbath. And we claim this promise in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.